Chapter One, Section One of the History of Mr. Polly. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Adrian Pretzelis in Santa Rosa, California. The History of Mr. Polly by H. G. Wells. Chapter the First. Beginnings and the Bazaar. Section One. Howl, said Mr. Polly, and then for a change and with greatly increased emphasis, Owl. He paused, and then broke out with one of his private and peculiar idioms. Oh, beastly, silly wheeze of a howl. He was sitting on a stile between two threadbare-looking fields, and suffering acutely from indigestion. He suffered from indigestion now nearly every afternoon in his life, but as he lacked introspection he projected the associated discomfort upon the world. Every afternoon he discovered afresh that life as a whole, and every aspect of life that presented itself, was beastly, and this afternoon, lured by the delusive blueness of a sky that was blue because the wind was in the east, he had come out in the hope of snatching something of the joyousness of spring. The mysterious alchemy of mind and body refused, however, to permit any joyousness whatever in the spring. He had had a little difficulty in finding his cap before he came out. He wanted his cap, the new golf cap, and Mrs. Polly must needs fish out his old soft brown felt hat. "'Here's your hat,' she said in a tone of insincere encouragement. He had been rooting among the piled newspapers under the kitchen dresser, and had turned quite hopefully and taken the thing. He put it on, but it didn't feel right. Nothing felt right. He put a trembling hand upon the crown of the thing, and pressed it on his head, and tried it askew to the right, and then askew to the left. Then the full sense of the indignity offered him came home to him. The hat masked the upper sinister quarter of his face, and he spoke with a wrathful eye regarding his wife from under the brim. In a voice thick with fury he said, "'I suppose you'd like me to wear that silly mud pie for ever, eh? I tell you, I won't. I'm sick of it. I'm pretty much sick of everything comes to that. Hat!' He clutched it with quivering fingers. Hat! he repeated. Then he flung it to the ground and kicked it with extraordinary fury across the kitchen. It flew up against the door and dropped to the ground with its ribbon band half off. Shan't go out, he said, and, sticking his hands into his jacket pockets, discovered the missing cap in the right one. There was nothing for it but to go straight upstairs without a word, and out, slamming the shop door hard. "'Beauty,' said Mrs. Polly at last, to a tremendous silence, picking up and dusting the rejected headdress. "'Tantrums,' she added, "'I haven't patience.' And moving with the slow reluctance of a deeply offended woman, she began to pile together the simple apparatus of their recent meal for transportation to the scullery sink. The repast she had prepared for him did not seem to her to justify his ingratitude. There had been the cold pork from Sunday and some nice cold potatoes, and Rashdall's mixed pickles, of which he was inordinately fond. He had eaten three gherkins, two onions, a small cauliflower head, and several capers, with every appearance of appetite, and indeed with avidity. And there had been cold suet pudding to follow with treacle, and then a nice bit of cheese. It was the pale, hard sort of cheese he liked. Red cheese, he declared, was indigestible. 
He had also had three big slices of greyish baker's bread, and had drunk the best part of the jugful of beer. But there seems no pleasing some people. Tantrums, said Mrs. Polly at the sink, struggling with the mustard on his plate, and expressing the only solution of the problem that occurred to her. And Mr. Polly sat on the stile, and hated the whole scheme of life, which was at once excessive and inadequate as a solution. He hated Foxbourne, he hated Foxbourne High Street, he hated his shop and his wife and his neighbours, every blessed neighbour, and with indescribable bitterness he hated himself. "'Why did I ever get in this silly hole?' he said. "'Why did I ever?' He sat on the stile and looked with eyes that seemed blurred with impalpable flaws at a world in which even the spring buds were wilted. The sunlight metallic, and the shadows mixed with blue-black ink. To the moralist I know he might have served as a figure of sinful discontent, but that is because it is the habit of moralists to ignore material circumstances. If indeed one may speak of a recent meal as a circumstance, with Mr. Polly Circum. Drink, indeed, our teachers will criticise nowadays, both as regards quantity and quality. But neither church nor state nor school will raise a warning finger between a man and his hunger and his wife's catering. So on nearly every day of his life Mr. Polly fell into a violent rage and hatred against the outer world in the afternoon, and never suspected that it was this inner world to which I am with such masterly delicacy alluding that was thus reflecting its sinister disorder upon the things without. It is a pity that some human beings are not more transparent. If Mr. Polly, for example, had been transparent or even passably translucent, then perhaps he might have realised, from the Laocoon struggle he would have glimpsed, that indeed he was not so much a human being as a civil war. Wonderful things must have been going on inside Mr. Polly. Oh, wonderful things! It must have been like a badly managed industrial city during a period of depression. Agitators, acts of violence, strikes of the forces of the law and order doing their best, rushings to and fro, upheavals, the Marseillais, tumbrils, the rumble and thunder of the tumbrils. I do not know why the east wind aggravates life to unhealthy people. It made Mr. Polly's teeth seem loose in his head, and his skin feel like a misfit, and his hair a dry, stringy exasperation. Why cannot doctors give us an antidote to the east wind? Never have the sense to get your hair cut till it's too long, said Mr. Polly, catching sight of his shadow. You blighted, degenerated paint-brush! Ugh! And he flattened down the projecting tails with an urgent hand. Section 2 Mr. Polly's age was exactly thirty-five years and a half. He was a short, compact figure, and a little inclined to a localised embonpoint. His face was not unpleasing, the features fine, but a trifle too pointed about the nose to be classically perfect. The corners of his sensitive mouth were depressed. His eyes were ruddy brown and troubled, and the left one was round with more of wonder in it than its fellow. His complexion was dull and yellowish. That, as I have explained, on account of those civil disturbances. He was, in the technical sense of the word, clean-shaved, with a small, sallow patch under the right ear and a cut on the chin. His brow had the little puckerings of a thoroughly discontented man, 
little wrinklings and lumps, particularly over his right eye, and he sat with his hands in his pockets, a little askew on the stile, and swung one leg. Hole, he repeated presently. He broke into a quavering song. Oh, rotten, beastly, silly hole. His voice thickened with rage, and the rest of his discourse was marred by an unfortunate choice of epithets. He was dressed in a shabby black morning coat and vest. The braid that bound these garments was a little loose in places. His collar was chosen from stock and with projecting corners, technically a wing-poke. That and his tie, which was new and loose and rich in colouring, had been selected to encourage and stimulate customers, for he dealt in gentlemen's outfitting. His golf cap, which was also from stock and a slant over his eye, gave his mystery a desperate touch. He wore brown leather boots, because he hated the smell of blacking. Perhaps, after all, it was not simply indigestion that troubled him. Behind the superficialities of Mr. Polly's being moved a larger and vaguer distress. The elementary education he had acquired had left him with the impression that arithmetic was a flunky science, and best avoided in practical affairs. But even the absence of bookkeeping and a total inability to distinguish between capital and interest could not blind him for ever to the fact that the little shop in the high street was not paying. An absence of returns, a construction of credit, a depleted till, the most valiant resolves to keep smiling, could not prevail for ever against these insistent phenomena. One might bustle about in the morning before dinner, and in the afternoon after tea, and forget that huge dark cloud of insolvency that gathered and spread in the backgrounds, but it was part of the desolation of these afternoon periods, these grey spaces of time after meals, when all one's courage had descended to the unseen battles of the pit, that life seemed stripped to the bone, and one saw with a hopeless clearness. Let me tell the history of Mr. Polly from the cradle to these present difficulties. First the infant, mewling and puking in its nurse's arms. There had been a time when two people had thought Mr. Polly the most wonderful and adorable thing in the world, had kissed his toenails, saying, Nyum, nyum, and marvelled at the exquisite softness and delicacy of his hair and had called to one another to remark the particular distinction with which he bubbled, and had disputed whether the sound he had made was just dada, or truly and intentionally dada, had washed him in the utmost detail, and wrapped him up in soft warm blankets, and smothered him with kisses. A regal time that was, and four and thirty years ago and a merciful forgetness barred Mr. Polly from ever bringing its careless luxury, its autocratic demands and instant obedience, into contrast with his present condition of life. These two people had worshipped him from the crown of his head to the soles of his exquisite feet, and also they had fed him rather unwisely, for no one had ever troubled to teach his mother anything about the mysteries of a child's upbringing, though, of course, the monthly nurse and her charwoman gave some valuable hints, and by his fifth birthday the perfect rhythms of his nice new exterior were already darkened with perplexity. His mother died when he was seven. He began only to have distinctive memories of himself in the time when his education had already begun. I remember seeing a picture of education in some place. I think it was education, but quite conceivably it represented the Empire teaching her sons, 
and I have a strong impression that it was a wall painting upon some public building in Manchester or Birmingham or Glasgow, but very possibly I'm mistaken about that. It represented a glorious woman with a wise and fearless face stooping over her children and pointing them to far horizons. The sky displayed the pearly warmth of a summer dawn, and all the painting was marvellously bright, as if with the youth and hope of the delicately beautiful children in the foreground. She was telling them, one felt, of the great prospect of life that opened before them, of the spectacle of the world, the splendours of sea and mountain they might travel and see the joys of skill they might acquire, of effort and the pride of effort, and the devotions and nobilities it was theirs to achieve. Perhaps she even whispered of the warm triumphant mystery of love that comes at last to those who have patience and unblemished hearts. She was reminding them of their great heritage as English children, rulers of more than one-fifth of mankind, of the obligation to do and to be the best that such a pride of empire entails, of their essential nobility and knighthood, and the restraints and the charities and the undisciplined strength that is becoming in knights and rulers. The education of Mr. Polly did not follow this picture very closely. He went for some time to a national school which was run on severely economical lines to keep down the rates by a largely untrained staff. He was set sums to do that he did not understand and that no one made him understand. He was made to read the Catechism and Bible with the utmost industry and an entire disregard of pronunciation or significance, and caused to imitate writing copies and drawing copies and given object lessons upon sealing wax and silk worms and potato bugs and ginger and iron and such like things, and taught various other subjects his mind refused to entertain, and afterwards, when he was about twelve, he was jerked by his parents to finish off in a private school of dingy aspect and still dingier pretensions where there were no object lessons, and the studies of bookkeeping and French were pursued, but never effectively overtaken, under the guidance of an elderly gentleman who wore a nondescript gown and took snuff, wrote copperplate, explained nothing, and used a cane with remarkable dexterity and gusto. Mr. Polly went into the national school at six, and he left the private school at fourteen and by that time his mind was in much the same state that you would be in, dear reader, if you were operated upon for appendicitis by a well-meaning, boldly enterprising, but rather overworked and underpaid butcher-boy, who was superseded toward the climax of the operation by a left-handed clerk of high principles but intemperate habits. That is to say, it was in a thorough mess. The nice little curiosities and willingnesses of a child were in a jumbled and thwarted condition, hacked and cut about. The operators had left, so to speak, all their sponges and ligatures in the mangled confusion, and Mr. Polly had lost much of his natural confidence, so far as figures and sciences and languages and the possibilities of learning things were concerned. He thought of the present world no longer as a wonderland of experiences, but as geography and history, as the repeating of names that were hard to pronounce, and lists of products and populations and heights and lengths, and as lists and dates. Oh, and boredom indescribable! He thought of religion as the recital of more or less incomprehensible words that were hard to remember, and of the divinity as a limitless being having the nature of a schoolmaster and making infinite rules 
known and unknown rules that were always ruthlessly enforced, and with an infinite capacity for punishment, and, most horrible of all to think of, limitless powers of espial, so that to the best of his ability he did not think of that unrelenting eye. He was uncertain about the spelling and pronunciation of most of the words in our beautiful but abundant and perplexing tongue. That especially was a pity, because words attracted him, and under happier conditions he might have used them well. He was always doubtful whether it was eight sevens or nine eights that was sixty-three. He knew no method for settling the difficulty, and he thought the merit of a drawing consisted in the care in which it was lined in. Lining in bored him beyond measure. But the indigestions of mind and body that were to play so large a part in his subsequent career were still only beginning. His liver and his gastric juice, his wonder and imagination, kept up a fight against the things that threatened to overwhelm soul and body together. Outside the regions devastated by the school curriculum, he was still intensely curious. He had cheerful phases of enterprise, and about thirteen he suddenly discovered reading and its joys. He began to read stories voraciously and books of travel, provided they were also adventurous. He got these chiefly from the local institute, and he also took in, irregularly but thoroughly, one of those inspiring weeklies that dull people used to call penny dreadfuls, admirable weeklies crammed with imagination that the cheap boys' comics of today have replaced. At fourteen, when he emerged from the valley of the shadow of education, there survived something, indeed it survived still, obscured and thwarted, at five and thirty, that pointed not with a visible and prevailing finger like the finger of that beautiful woman in the picture, but pointed nevertheless to the idea that there was interest and happiness in the world. Deep in the being of Mr. Polly, deep in that darkness, like a creature which has been beaten about the head and left for dead, but that still lives, crawled a persuasion that over and above the things that are jolly and bits of all right, there was beauty, there was delight, that somewhere, magically inaccessible perhaps, but still somewhere, were pure and easy and joyous states of body and mind. He would sneak out on moonless winter nights and stare up at the stars, and afterwards find it difficult to tell his father where he had been. He would read tales about hunters and explorers, and imagine himself riding mustangs as fleet as the wind across the prairies of Western America, or coming as a conquering and adored white man into the swarming villages of Central Africa. He shot bears with a revolver, a cigarette in the other hand, and made a necklace of their teeth and claws for the chief's beautiful young daughter. Also he killed a lion with a pointed stake, stabbing through the beast's heart as it stood over him. He thought it would be splendid to be a diver, and go down into the dark green mysteries of the sea. He led stormers against well-nigh impregnable forts, and died on the ramparts at the moment of victory. His grave was watered by a nation's tears. He rammed and torpedoed ships, one against ten. He was beloved by queens in barbaric lands, and reconciled whole nations to the Christian faith. He was martyred, and took it very calmly and beautifully, not only once, but twice, after the revivalist week. It did not become a habit with him. He explored the Amazon, and found, newly exposed by the fall of a great tree, a rock of gold. Engaged in these pursuits, he would neglect the work immediately in hand, sitting somewhat slackly on the form, 
and projecting himself in a manner tempting to a schoolmaster with a cane, and twice he had books confiscated. Recalled to the realities of life, he would rub himself or sigh deeply as the occasion required, and resume his attempts to write as good as copperplate. He hated writing. The ink always crept up his fingers, and the smell of ink offended him. He was filled with unexpressed doubts. Why should writing slope down from right to left? Why should downstrokes be thick and upstrokes thin? Why should the handle of one's pen point over one's right shoulder? His copy-books toward the end foreshadowed his destiny, and took the form of commercial documents. "'Dear Sir,' they ran, "'referring to your esteemed order of the twenty-sixth alt, we beg to inform you,' and so on. The compression of Mr. Polly's mind and soul in the educational institutions of his time was terminated abruptly by his father between his fourteenth and fifteenth birthday. His father, who had long since forgotten the time when his son's little limbs seemed to have come straight from God's hand, and when he had kissed five minute toenails in a rapture of loving tenderness, remarked, "'It's time that dratted boy did something for a living,' and a month or so later Mr. Polly began that career in business that led him at last to the sole proprietorship of a bankrupt outfitter's shop, and to the stile on which he was sitting. End of chapter one, section one. Chapter one, section two of the history of Mr. Polly. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Adrian Pretzelis. Three. Mr. Polly was not naturally interested in hosiery and gentlemen's outfitting. At times, indeed, he urged himself to a spurious curiosity about that trade, but presently something more congenial came along and checked the effort. He was apprenticed in one of those large, rather low-class establishments which sell everything, from pianos and furniture to books and millinery. A department store, in fact. The Port Burdock Drapery Bazaar at Port Burdock, one of the three townships that are grouped around the Port Burdock Naval Dockyards. There he remained six years. He spent most of the time inattentive to business in a sort of uncomfortable happiness, increasing his indigestion. On the whole, he preferred business to school. The hours were longer, but the tension was not nearly so great. The place was better aired, you were not kept in for no reason at all, and the cane was not employed. You watched the growth of your moustache with interest and impatience, and mastered the beginnings of social intercourse. You talked, and found there were things amusing to say. Also you had regular pocket money and a voice in the purchase of your clothes, and presently a small salary. And there were girls, and friendship. In the retrospect, Port Burdock sparkled with the facets of quite a cluster of remembered jolly times. "'Didn't save much money, though,' said Mr. Polly. The first apprentice's dormitory was a long, bleak room, with six beds, six chests of drawers and looking-glasses, and a number of boxes of wood or tin. It opened into a still longer and bleaker room of eight beds, and this into a third apartment with yellow-grained paper and American cloth tables, which was the dining-room by day and the men's sitting and smoking-room after nine. Here Mr. Polly, who had been an only child, first tasted the joys of social intercourse. At first there were attempts to bully him, on account of his refusal to consider face-washing a diurnal duty, but two fights with the apprentices next above him 
established a useful reputation for collar, and the presence of girl apprentices in the shop somehow raised his standard of cleanliness to a more acceptable level. He didn't, of course, have very much to do with the feminine staff in his department, but he spoke to them casually as he traversed foreign parts of the bazaar, or got out of their way politely, or helped them lift down heavy boxes, and on such occasion he felt their scrutiny. Except in the course of business or at meal-times, the men and women of the establishment had very little opportunity of meeting. The men were in their rooms, and the girls in theirs. Yet these feminine creatures, at once so near and so remote, affected him profoundly. He would watch them going to and fro, and marvel secretly at the beauty of their hair, or the roundness of their necks, or the warm softness of their cheeks, or the delicacy of their hands. He would fall into passions for them at dinner-time, and try to show devotions by his manner of passing the bread and margarine at tea. There was a very fair-haired, fair-skinned apprentice at the adjacent haberdashery, to whom he said good morning every morning, and for a period it seemed to him the most significant event in his day. When she said, I do hope it will be fine to-morrow, he felt it marked an epoch. He had had no sisters, and was innately disposed to worship womankind. But he did not betray as much to Platt and Parsons. To Platt and Parsons he affected an attitude of seasoned depravity towards womankind. Platt and Parsons were his contemporary apprentices in departments of the drapery shop, and the three were drawn together into a close friendship by the fact that all their names began with P. They decided they were the three P's, and went about together of an evening with the bearing of desperate dogs. Sometimes when they had money they went into public houses and had drinks. Then they would become more desperate than ever, and walk along the pavement under the gas-lamps, arm in arm, singing. Platt had a good tenor voice, and had been in a church choir, and so he led the singing. Parsons had a serviceable bellow, which roared and faded and roared again very wonderfully. Mr. Polly's share was an extraordinary lowing noise, a sort of flat recitative which he called singing seconds. They would have sung catches if they had known how to do it, but as it was they sung melancholy music-hall songs about dying soldiers and the old folks far away. They would sometimes go into the quieter residential quarters of Port Burdock, where policemen and other obstacles were infrequent, and really let their voices soar like hawks, and feel very happy. The dogs of the district would be stirred to hopeless emulation, and would keep it up for long after the three peas had been swallowed up by the night. One jealous brute of an Irish terrier made a gallant attempt to bite Parsons, but was beaten by numbers and solidarity. The three peas took the utmost interest in each other, and found no company so good. They talked about everything in the world, and would go on talking in their dormitory after the gas was out until the other men were reduced to throwing boots. They skulked from their departments in the slack hours of the afternoon to gossip in the packing-room of the warehouse. On Sundays and bank holidays they went for long walks together, talking. Platt was white-faced and dark, and disposed to undertones and mystery and a curiosity about society and the demi-monde. He kept himself en courant by reading a penny paper of infinite suggestion called Modern Society. Parsons was of an ampler build, already promising fatness, with curly hair and a lot of rolling, rollicking, curly features and a large blob-shaped nose. 
He had a great memory and a real interest in literature. He knew great portions of Shakespeare and Milton by heart, and would recite them at the slightest provocation. He read everything he could get hold of, and if he liked it, he read it aloud. It did not matter who else liked it. At first Mr. Polly was disposed to be suspicious of this literature, but was carried away by Parson's enthusiasm. The three peas went to a performance of Romeo and Juliet at the Port Burdock Theatre Royal, and hung over the gallery, fascinated. After that they made a sort of password out of, Do you bite your thumbs at us, sir? To which the countersign was, We bite our thumbs. For weeks the glory of Shakespeare's Verona lit Mr. Polly's life. He walked as though he carried a sword at his side, and swung a mantle from his shoulders. He went through the grimy streets of Port Burdock with his eye on the first-floor windows, looking for balconies. A ladder in the yard flooded his mind with romantic ideas. Then Parsons discovered an Italian writer, whose name Mr. Polly rendered as Boccaccio, and after some excursions into that author's remains, the talk of Parsons became infested with the word amours and Mr. Polly would stand in front of his hosiery fixtures, trifling with paper and string, and thinking of perennial picnics under dark olive trees in the everlasting sunshine of Italy. And about that time it was that all three peas adopted turn-down collars and large, loose, artistic silk ties, which they tied very much on one side, and wore with an air of defiance and a certain swashbuckling carriage. And then there came the glorious revelation of that great Frenchman whom Mr. Polly called Rabelais. The three peas thought the birth feast of Gargantua the most glorious piece of writing in the world, and I'm not sure that they were wrong. And on wet Sunday evenings, when there was the danger of him singing, they would get Parsons to read it aloud. Towards the several members of the Y.M.C.A. who shared the dormitory, the three P's maintained a sarcastic and defiant attitude. "'We got a perfect right to do what we want in our corner,' Platt maintained. "'You do what you like in yours.' "'But the language,' objected Morrison, the white-faced, earnest-eyed improver who was leading a profoundly religious life under great difficulties. "'Language, man!' roared Parsons. "'Why, it's literature!' "'Sunday isn't the time for literature.' "'It's the only time we've got. And besides—' The horrors of religious controversy would begin. Mr. Polly stuck loyally to the three Ps, but in the secret places of his heart— he was torn. A fire of conviction burnt in Morrison's eyes, and spoke in his urgent, persuasive voice. He lived the better life manifestly, chaste in word and deed, industrious, studiously kindly. When the junior apprentice had sore feet and homesickness, Morrison washed the feet and comforted the heart and he helped other men to get through their work when he might have gone early, a superhuman thing to do. Polly was secretly a little afraid to be left alone with this man and the power of the spirit that was in him. He felt watched. Platt, also struggling with things his mind could not contrive to reconcile, said, "'That confounded hypocrite!' "'He's no hypocrite,' said Parsons. He's no hypocrite, old man, but he's got no blessed joy de vive. That's what's wrong with him. Let's go down to the Harbour Arms and see some of those blessed old captains getting drunk. Short of sugar, old man, said Mr. Polly, slapping his trouser pocket. Oh, come on, said Parsons. Always do it on tuppence for a bit, eh? Let me get my pipe on said Platt, who had recently taken to smoking with great ferocity. Then I'm with you. 
pause and struggle. "'Don't ram it down, old man,' said Parsons, watching with knitted brows. "'Don't ram it down. Give it air. Seen my stick, old man? Right-o!' And, leaning on his cane, he composed himself in an attitude of sympathetic patience towards Platt's incendiary efforts. 4. Jolly days of companionship they were for the incipient bankrupt on the stile to look back upon. The interminable working hours of the bazaar had long since faded from his memory, except for one or two conspicuous rows and one or two larks, but the rare Sundays and holidays shone out like diamonds among pebbles. They shone with the mellow splendour of evening skies reflected in calm water, and athwart them all went old Parsons, bellowing an interpretation of life, gesticulating, appreciating, and making appreciate, expounding books, talking of that mystery of his, the joy de vivre. There were some particularly splendid walks on bank holidays. The three peas would start on Sunday morning early and find a room in some modest inn and talk themselves asleep, and return singing through the night, or having an argy-bargy about the stars on Monday evening. They would come over the hills out of the pleasant English countryside in which they had wandered, and see Port Burdock spread out below, a network of interlacing street lamps and shifting tram lights against the black, beacon-gemmed immensity of the harbour waters. "'Back to the collar, old man,' Parsons would say. There is no satisfactory plural to old man, so he always used it in the singular. "'Don't mention it,' said Platt. And once they got a boat for the whole summer day, and rowed up past the moored ironclads, and the black old hulks, and the various shipping of the harbour, past the white troop-ship, and past the trim front, and the ships, and interesting vistas of the dockyard, to shallow channels, and rocky, weedy wildernesses of the upper harbour. And Parsons and Mr. Polly had a great dispute and quarrel that day, as to how far a big gun could shoot. The country over the hills behind Port Burdock is all that an old-fashioned, scarcely disturbed English countryside should be. In those days the bicycle was still rare and costly, and the motor-car had yet to come and stir up rural serenities. The three peas would take footpaths haphazard across fields, and plunge into unknown winding lanes between high hedges of honeysuckle and dog-rose. Greatly daring, they would follow green bridle-paths through primrose-studded undergrowths, or wander waist-deep in the bracken of beech-woods. About twenty miles from Port Burdock there came a region of hop-gardens and host-crowned farms, and further on, to be reached only by cheap tickets at bank holiday times, was a sterile ridge of very clean roads and red sand-pits and pine and gorse and heather. The three peas could not afford to buy bicycles, and they found boots the greatest item of their skimpy expenditure. They threw appearance to the winds at last, and got ready-made working men's hobnails. There was much discussion and strong feeling in this step in the dormitory. There is no countryside like the English countryside for those who have learned to love it. Its firm yet gentle lines of hill and dale, its ordered confusion of features, its deer parks and downlands, its castles and stately houses, its hamlets and old churches, its farms and ricks and great barns and ancient trees, its pools and ponds and shining threads of rivers, its flower-starred hedgerows, its orchards and woodland patches, its village greens and kindly inns. Other countrysides have their pleasant aspects, but none such variety. 
none that shine so steadfastly through the year. Picardy is pink and white and pleasant in the blossom time. Burgundy goes on with its sunshine and wild hillsides and cramped vineyards, a beautiful tune repeated and repeated. Italy gives salatas and wayside chapels and chestnuts and olive orchards. The Ardennes has its woods and gorges, Touraine and the Rhineland, the wide Campania with its distant Apennines, and the neat prosperities and mountain backgrounds of South Germany. All clamour their especial merits at one's memory, and there are the hills and fields of Virginia, like an England grown very big and slovenly, the trim New England landscape, a little bleak and rather fine like the New England mind, and the wide, rough country roads and hills and woodland of New York State. But none of these change scene and character in three miles of walking, nor have so mellow a sunlight, nor so diversified a cloudland, nor confess the perpetual refreshment of the strong, soft winds that blow off the sea as our mother England does. It was good for the three peas to walk through such a land, and forget for a time that indeed they had no footing in it all, that they were doomed to toil behind counters in such places as Port Burdock for the better part of their lives. They would forget the customers and shop-walkers and department buyers and everything, and become just happy wanderers in a world of pleasant breezes and bird songs and shady trees. The arrival at the inn was a great affair. No one, they were convinced, would take them for drapers, and there might be a pretty serving girl, or a jolly old lady, or what Parsons called a bit of a character, drinking in the bar. There would always be waiting inquiries as to what they could have, and it would work out always at cold beef and pickles, or fried ham and eggs and shandy gaff, two pints of beer and two bottles of ginger beer foaming in a huge round-bellied jug. The glorious moment of standing lordly at the inn doorway and staring out at the world, the swinging sign, the geese upon the green, the duck-pond, a waiting wagon, the church-tower, a sleepy cat, the blue heavens, with the sizzle of the frying audible behind one, the keen smell of the bacon, the trotting feet bearing the repast, the click and clatter as the tableware is finally arranged, a clean white cloth. Ready, sir, or ready, gentlemen. Better hearing that than, forward, Polly, look sharp. The going in, the sitting down, the falling too. Bread, O oh man. Right, O. Oh. Don't bag all the crust, old man. Once a simple-mannered girl in a pink print dress stayed and talked with them as they ate. Led by the gallant Parsons, they professed to be all desperately in love with her, and courted her to say which she preferred of them. It was so manifest she did prefer one, and so impossible to say which it was held her there until a distant maternal voice called her away. Afterwards, as they left the inn, she waylaid them at the orchard corner, and gave them, a little shyly, three keen yellow-green apples, and wished them to come again some day, and vanished, and reappeared looking after them as they turned the corner, waving a white handkerchief. All the rest of the day they disputed over the signs of her favour, and the next Sunday they went there again. But she had vanished, and a mother of forbidding aspect afforded no explanations. If Platt and Parsons and Mr. Polly live to be a hundred, they will none of them forget that girl as she stood with a pink flush upon her, faintly smiling and yet earnest parting the branches of the hedgerows, 
and reaching down apple in hand. Which of them was it had caught her spirit to attend to them? And once they went along the coast, following it as closely as possible, and so they came at last to Foxbourne, that easternmost suburb of Brailing and Hampstead-on-the-Sea. Foxbourne seemed a very jolly little place to Mr. Polly that afternoon. It has a clean sandy beach instead of the mud and pebbles and coaly defilement of Port Burdock, a row of six bathing machines, and a shelter on the parade in which the three peas sat after a satisfying but rather expensive lunch that had included celery. Rows of verandahed villas proffered apartments. They had feasted in an hotel with a porch painted white, and gay with geraniums above, and the high street with the old church at the head had been full of an agreeable afternoon stillness. "'Nice little place for a business,' said Platt sagely from behind his big pipe. It stuck in Mr. Polly's memory. Five. Mr. Polly was not so picturesque a youth as Parsons. He lacked richness in his voice, and went about in these days with his hands in his pockets, looking quietly speculative. He specialised in slang and the disuse of English, and he played the role of an appreciative stimulant to Parsons. Words attracted him curiously, words rich in suggestion and he loved a novel and striking phrase. His school training had given him little or no mastery of the mysterious pronunciation of English, and no confidence in himself. His schoolmaster, indeed, had been both unsound and variable. New words had terror and fascination for him. He did not acquire them, he could not avoid them, and so he plunged into them. His only rule was not to be misled by the spelling. That was no guide, anyhow. He avoided every recognised phrase in the language, and mispronounced everything in order that he shouldn't be suspected of ignorance, but whim. Sesquipleden, he would say, sesquipleden virgibus. Eh? said Platt. Eloquent rhapsodus. Where? asked Platt. In the warehouse, old man. All among the tablecloths and blankets. Carlyle. He's reading aloud. Doing the high froth. Spuming. Windmilling. Wah, wah. It's a sight worth seeing. He'll bark his blessed knuckles one of these days on the fixtures, old man. He held an imaginary book in one hand and waved an eloquent gesture. Here too shall every hero, in so much as notwithstanding for evermore, come back to reality. He parodied the enthusiastic Parsons, so that in fashion and thereby upon things and not under things, articulariously, he stands. I should laugh if the governor dropped on him said Platt. He'd never hear him coming. The old man's drunk with it. Fair drunk, said Polly. I never did. It's worse than when he got on to Rabaloose. End of chapter one. Chapter two of The History of Mr. Polly. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Adrian Pretzelis. Chapter Two, The Dismissal of Parsons. One. Suddenly, Parsons got himself dismissed. He got himself dismissed under circumstances of peculiar violence that left a deep impression on Mister Polly's mind. He wondered about it for years afterwards, trying to get the rights of the case. Parsons' apprenticeship was over. He had reached the status of an improver, and he dressed the window of the Manchester department. By all the standards available, he dressed it very well. By his own standards, he dressed it 
wonderfully. "'Well, old man,' he used to say, "'there's one thing about my position here. I can dress a window.' And when trouble was under discussion, he was told that Little Fluffums, which was the apprentice's name for Mr. Garvace, the senior partner and managing director of the bazaar, would think twice before he got rid of the only man in the place who could make a window full of Manchester goods tell. Then, like many a fellow artist, he fell prey to theories. The art of window dressing is in its infancy, old man, in its blooming infancy. All balance and stuffiness, like a blessed Egyptian picture. No joy in it, no blooming joy. Conventional. A shop window ought to get hold of people, grip em as they go along. It stands to reason. Grip. His voice would sink to a kind of quiet bellow. Do they grip? Then, after a pause, a savage roar. No. He's got a heavy on, said Mr. Polly. Go it, old man. Let's have some more of it. Look at old Morrison's dress stuff windows. Tidy, tasteful, correct, I grant you, but bleak. He let out the word reinforced to a shout. Bleak. Bleak, echoed Mr. Polly. Just pieces of stuff in rows, rows of tidy little puffs, perhaps one bit just unrolled, quiet tickets. Might as well be in church, old man, said Mr. Polly. A window ought to be exciting, said Parsons. It ought to make you say, hello, when you see it. He paused, and Platt watched him over a snorting pipe. Rococo, said Mr. Polly. We want a new school of window dressing, said Parsons, regardless of the comment. A new school, the Port Burdock School. Day after tomorrow, I change the Fitzallen Street stuff. This time it's going to be a change. I mean to have a crowd or bust. And, as a matter of fact, he did both. His voice dropped to a note of self-reproach. I've been timid, old man. I've been holding myself in. I haven't done myself justice. I've kept down the simmering, seething, teeming ideas. All that's over now. Over, gulped Polly. Over for good and all, old man. Two. Platt came to Polly, who was sorting up collar-boxes. "'Old man's doing his blooming window.' "'What window?' "'What he said.' Polly remembered. He went on with his collar-boxes, with his eye on his senior, Mansfield. Mansfield was presently called away to the counting-house, and instantly Polly shot out by the street door, and made a rapid transit across the street front past the Manchester window, and so into the silk-room door. He could not linger long, but he gathered joy, a swift, fearful joy, from his brief inspection of Parsons' unconscious back. Parsons had his tail-coat off, and was working with vigour. His habit of pulling his waistcoat straps to the utmost brought out all the agreeable promise of corpulence in his youthful frame. He was blowing excitedly, and running his fingers through his hair, and then moving with all the swift eagerness of a man inspired. All about his feet and knees were scarlet blankets. Not folded, not formally unfolded, but, uh, the only phrase is, shied about. And a great bar sinister of roller toweling stretched across the front of the window, on which was a ticket and the ticket said, in bold black letters, LOOK. So soon as Mr. Polly got into the silk department and met Platt, 
he knew he had not lingered nearly long enough outside. "'Did you see the boards at the back?' said Platt. He hadn't. "'The high egregious is fairly on,' he said, and dived down to return by his devious subterranean routes to the outfitting department. Presently the street door opened, and Platt, with an air of intense devotion to business, assumed to cover his adoption of that unusual route, came in and made for the staircase down to the warehouse. He rolled up his eyes at Polly. "'Oh, law!' he said, and vanished. Irresistible curiosity seized Polly. Should he go through the shop to the Manchester department, or risk a second transit outside? He was impelled to make a dive at the street door. "'Where are you going?' asked Mansfield. "'Lil Dog,' said Polly, with an air of lucid explanation, and left him to get any meaning he could from it. Parsons was worth the subsequent trouble. Parsons really was extremely rich. This time Polly stopped to take it in. Parsons had made a huge symmetrical pile of thick white and red blankets, twisted and rolled to accentuate their woolly richness, heaped up in warm disorder, with large window tickets inscribed in blazing red letters, cosy comfort at cut prices, and curl up and cuddle below cost. Regardless of the daylight, he had turned up the electric light on that side of the window to reflect a warm glow upon the heap, and behind, in pursuit of contrasted bleakness, he was now hanging long strips of grey silesia and chilly-coloured linen dusterings. It was wonderful, but uh, Mr. Polly decided it was time he went in. He found Platt in the silk department, apparently on the verge of another plunge into the exterior world. "'Cosy comfort at cut prices,' said Polly. "'Alliteration's artful aid.' He did not dare go into the street for the third time, and he was hovering feverishly near the window when he saw the Governor, Mr. Garvace, that is to say, the managing director of the bazaar, walking along the pavement after his manner to assure himself all was well with the establishment he guided. Mr. Garvace was a short, stout man, with that air of modest pride that so often goes with corpulence. Choleric and decisive in manner, and with hands that looked like bunches of fingers. He was red-haired and ruddy, and after the custom of such complexions, hairs sprang from the tip of his nose. When he wished to bring the power of the human eye to bear upon an assistant, he projected his chest, knitted one brow, and partly closed the left eyelid. An expression of speculative wonder overspread the countenance of Mr. Polly. He felt he must see. Yes, whatever happened, he must see. "'Want to speak to Parsons, sir?' he said to Mr. Mansfield, and deserted his post hastily, dashed through the intervening departments, and was in position behind a pile of bolt and sheeting as the Governor came in out of the street. "'What on earth do you think you're doing with that window, Parsons?' began Mr. Garvace. Only the legs of Parsons and the lower part of his waistcoat and an intervening inch of shirt were visible. He was standing inside the window on the steps, hanging up the last strip of his background from the brass rail across the ceiling. Within, the Manchester shop window was cut off by a partition rather like the partition of an old-fashioned church pew, from the general space of the shop. There was a panelled barrier, that is to say, with a little door like a pew door in it. Parson's face appeared, staring with round eyes at his employer. Mr. Garvace had to repeat his question. 
dressing it, sir, on new lines. Come out of it, said Mr. Garvace. Parsons stared, and Mr. Garvace had to repeat his command. Parsons, with a dazed expression, began to descend the steps slowly. Mr. Garvace turned around. "'Where's Morrison? Morrison?' Morrison appeared. "'Take this window over,' said Mr. Garvace, pointing his bunch of fingers at Parsons. "'Take all this muddle out and dress it properly.' Morrison advanced and hesitated. "'I beg your pardon, sir,' said Parsons, with an immense politeness. "'But this is my window.' "'Take it all out,' said Mr. Garvace, turning away. Morrison advanced. Parsons shut the door with a click that arrested Mr. Garvace. "'Come out of that window,' he said. "'You can't dress it, if you want to play the fool with a window.' "'This window's all right,' said the genius in window-dressing, and there was a little pause. "'Open the door, and go right in,' said Mr. Garvace to Morrison. "'You leave that door alone, Morrison,' said Parsons. Polly was no longer even trying to hide behind the stack of Bolton sheetings. He realised he was in the presence of forces too stupendous to heed him. "'Get him out,' said Mr. Garvace. Morrison seemed to be thinking out the ethics of his position. The idea of loyalty to his employer prevailed with him. He laid his hand on the door to open it. Parsons tried to disengage his hand. Mr. Garvace joined his effort to Morrison's. Then the heart of Polly leapt, and the world blazed up to wonder and splendour. Parsons disappeared behind the partition for a moment, and reappeared instantly, gripping a thin cylinder of rolled huckerback. With this he smote at Morrison's head. Morrison's head ducked under the resounding impact, but he clung on, and so did Mr. Garvace. The door came open, and then Mr. Garvace was staggering back, hand to head, his autocratic, his sacred baldness, smitten. Parsons was beyond all control, a strangeness, a marvel. Heaven knows how the artistic struggle had strained that richly endowed temperament. "'Say I can't dress a window, you thundering old humbug!' he said, and hurled the hucker back at his master. He followed this up by hurling first a blanket, then an armful of silesia, then a window support, out of the window and into the shop. It leapt into Polly's mind that Parsons hated his own effort, and was glad to demolish it. For a crowded second Polly's mind was concentrated upon Parsons, infuriated, active like a figure of earthquake with its coat off, shying things headlong. Then he perceived the back of Mr. Garvace, and heard his gubernatorial voice crying to no one in particular, and everybody in general, Get him out of the window! He's mad! He's dangerous! Get him out of the window!" Then a crimson blanket was for a moment over the head of Mr. Garvace, and his voice, muffled for an instant, broke out into unwonted expletive. Then people had arrived from all parts of the bazaar. Luck, the ledger clerk, blundered against Polly and said, "'Help him!' Somerville, from the silks, vaulted the counter, and seized a chair by the back. Polly lost his head. He clawed at the bolt and sheeting before him, and if he could have detached a piece, he would certainly have hit somebody with it. As it was, he simply upset the pile. It fell away from Polly, and he had an impression of somebody squeaking as it went down. 
It was the sort of impression one discards. The collapse of the pile of goods just sufficed to end his subconscious efforts to get something to hit somebody with, and his whole attention focused itself upon the struggle in the window. For a splendid instant Parsons towered up over the active backs that clustered about the shop window door. An active whirl of gesture, tearing things down and throwing them. And then he went under. There was an instant's furious struggle, a crash, a second crash, and the crack of broken plate glass. Then a stillness, and heavy breathing. Parsons was overpowered. Polly, stepping over scattered pieces of bolt and sheeting, saw his transfigured friend with a dark cut that was not at present bleeding on the forehead, one arm held by Somerville and the other by Morrison. "'You, you, you annoyed me,' said Parsons, sobbing for breath. 3. There are events that detach themselves from the general stream of occurrences, and seem to partake of the nature of revelations. Such was this Parsons affair. It began by seeming grotesque. It ended disconcertingly. The fabric of Mr. Polly's daily life was torn, and beneath it he discovered depths and terrors. Life was not altogether a lark. The calling in of a policeman seemed, at the moment, a pantomime touch. But when it became manifest that Mr. Garvace was in a fury of vindictiveness, the affair took on a different complexion. The way in which the policeman made a note of everything and aspirated nothing impressed the sensitive mind of Polly profoundly. Polly presently found himself straightening up ties to the refrain of "'He then it you on the head, and In the dormitory that night Parsons had become heroic. He sat on the edge of the bed with his head bandaged, packing very slowly, and insisting over and again, "'He ought to have left my window alone, old man. He ought to have touched my window.' Polly was to go to the police court in the morning as a witness. The terror of that ordeal almost overshadowed the tragic fact that Parsons was not only summoned for assault, but swapped, and packing his box. Polly knew himself well enough to know that he would make a bad witness. He felt sure of one fact only, namely that he then hit him on the head, and— all the rest danced about in his mind now. And how it would dance about on the morrow, heaven only knew. Would there be a cross-examination? Is it perjury to make a slip? People did sometimes purgeus themselves. Serious offence. Platt was doing his best to help Parsons, and inciting public opinion against Morrison. But Parsons would not hear of anything against Morrison. He was all right, old man, according to his lights, said Parsons. It isn't him I complain of. He speculated on the morrow. I shall have to pay a fine, he said. No good trying to get out of it. It's true. I hit him. I hit him. He paused and seemed to be seeking an exquisite accuracy. His voice sank to a confidential note. On the head about here he answered the suggestion of a bright junior apprentice in a corner of the dormitory what's the good of a cross summons he replied with old corks the chemist and mottishead the house agent and all that lot on the bench humble pie that's my meal to-morrow old man humble pie packing went on for a time but lord what a life it is, said Parsons, giving his deep notes scope. 10.35, a man trying to do his duty, mistaken perhaps, but trying his best. 10.40, ruined, 
Ruined! He lifted his voice to a shout. Ruined! And dropped it to like an earthquake. Hated altercation, said Polly. Like a blooming earthquake, said Parsons, with the notes of a rising wind. He meditated gloomily upon his future, and a colder chill invaded Polly's mind. Likely to get another crib, ain't I, with assaulted the governor on my reference. I suppose, though, he wouldn't give me refs. Hard enough to get a crib at the best of times, said Parsons. You ought to go round with the show, old man, said Mr. Polly. Things were not so dreadful in the police court as Mr. Polly had expected. He was given a seat with other witnesses against the wall of the court, and after an interesting larceny case, Parsons appeared and stood, not in the dock, but at the table. By that time Mr. Polly's legs, which had been tucked up at first under his chair out of respect to the court, were extended straight before him, and his hands were in his trouser pockets. He was inventing names for the four magistrates on the bench, and had got to the grave and reverend seigneur and the palatial boco, when his thoughts were recalled to gravity by the sound of his name. He rose with alacrity, and was fielded by an expert policeman from a brisk attempt to get into the vacant dock. The clerk to the justices repeated the oath with incredible rapidity. Right o said Mr. Polly, but quite respectfully, and kissed the book. His evidence was simple and quite audible, after one warning from the superintendent of police to speak up. He tried to put in a good word for Parsons, by saying that he was naturally of a choleric disposition. But the start and the slow grin of enjoyment upon the face of the grave and reverend seigneur with the palatial boco suggested that the word was not so good as he had thought it. The rest of the bench was frankly puzzled, and there were hasty consultations. "'You mean he has a hot temper?' said the presiding magistrate. "'I mean he has a hot temper,' replied Polly, magically incapable of aspirates for the moment. "'You don't mean he catches cholera?' "'I mean he's easily put out.' "'Then why didn't you say so?' said the presiding magistrate. Parsons was bound over. He came for his luggage while everyone was in the shop, and Garvace would not let him invade the business to say good-bye. When Mr. Polly went upstairs for margarine and bread and tea, he slipped on into the dormitory at once to see what was happening further in the Parsons case. But Parsons had vanished. There was no Parsons no trace of Parsons. His cubicle was swept and garnished. For the first time in his life, Polly had a sense of irreparable loss. A minute or so after, Platt dashed in. Oh, he said, and then discovered Polly. Polly was leaning out of the window and did not look around. Platt went up to him. He's gone already, said Platt. Might have stopped to say good-bye to a chap. There was a little pause before Polly replied. He thrust his finger into his mouth and gulped. Bit on that beastly tooth of mine, he said, still not looking at Platt. It's made my eyes water something chronic. Anyone might think I was doing a blooming pipe by the look of me. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 of The History of Mr. Polly This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Adrian Pretzelis Chapter the Third Cribs 1. 
Port Burdock was never the same place for Mr. Polly after Parsons left it. There were no chest notes in his occasional letter, and little of the joy de vivre got through by them. Parsons had gone, he said, to London, and found a place as a warehouseman in a cheap outfitting store near St. Paul's Churchyard, where references were not required. It became apparent as time passed that new interests were absorbing him. He wrote of socialism and the rights of man, things that had no appeal for Mr. Polly. He felt strangers had got hold of his Parsons, were at work upon him, making him into someone else, something less picturesque. Port Burdock became a dreariness, full of faded memories of Parsons, and work a bore. Platt revealed himself alone as a tiresome companion, obsessed by romantic ideas about intrigues and vices and society women. Mr. Polly's depression manifested itself in a general slackness. A certain impatience in the manner of Mr. Garvace presently got upon his nerves. Relations were becoming strained. He asked for a rise of salary to test his position, and gave notice to leave when it was refused. It took him two months to place himself in another situation, and during that time he had quite a disagreeable amount of loneliness, disappointment, anxiety, and humiliation. He went at first to stay with a married cousin who had a house at Easewood. His widowed father had recently given up the music and bicycle shop, with the post of organist at the parish church that had sustained his income, and was living upon a small annuity as a guest with his cousin, and growing a little tiresome on account of some mysterious internal discomfort that the local practitioner diagnosed as imagination. He had aged with mysterious rapidity, and become excessively irritable. But the cousin's wife was a born manager, and contrived to get along with him. Our Mr. Polly's status was that of a guest, pure and simple. But after a fortnight of congested hospitality, in which he wrote nearly a hundred letters, beginning, Sir, referring to your advertisement in the Christian world for an improver in gents' outfitting, I beg to submit myself for the situation, have had six years' experience, and upset a bottle of ink over the toilet cover and the bedroom carpet. His cousin took him for a walk, and pointed out the superior advantages of apartments in London, from which to swoop upon the briefly yawning vacancy. "'Helpful,' said Mr. Polly. "'Very helpful, old man, indeed. I might have gone on there for weeks.' And packed. He got a room in an institution that was partly a benevolent hostel for men in his circumstances, and partly a high-minded but forbidding coffee-house, and a centre for pleasant Sunday afternoons. Mr. Polly spent a critical but pleasant Sunday afternoon in a back seat, inventing such phrases as, Soulful owner of the exorbitant largenial development, and Adam's apple being in question, earnest joy, exultant, urgent lubriosity. A manly young curate, marking and misunderstanding his preoccupied face and moving lips, came and sat by him, and entered into conversation with the idea of making him feel more at home. The conversation was awkward and disconnected for a minute or so, and then suddenly a memory of the Port Burdock Bazaar occurred to Mr. Polly, and with a baffling whisper of, Little dog, and a reassuring nod, he rose up and escaped, to wander out, relieved and observant, into the varied London streets. 
he found the collection of men he found waiting about in wholesale establishment in Wood Street and St. Paul's Churchyard, where they interview the buyers who have come up from the country, interesting and stimulating, but far too strongly charged with the suggestion of his own fate to be really joyful. There were men in all degrees, between confidence and distress, and in every stage between extravagant smartness and the last stages of decay. There were sunny young men, full of an abounding and elbowing energy, before whom the soul of Polly sank in hate and dismay. Smart juniors, said Polly to himself, full of smart juniosity, the chavacious cult. There were hungry-looking individuals of thirty-five or so that he decided must be proletarians. He had often wanted to find someone who fitted that attractive word. Middle-aged men, too old at forty, discoursed in the waiting-rooms on the outlook in the trade. It had never been so bad, they said, while Mr. Polly wondered if deduced was a permissible epithet. There were men with an overwhelming sense of their importance, manifestly annoyed and angry to find themselves still disengaged, and inclined to suspect a plot. And men so faint-hearted, one was terrified to imagine their behaviour when it came to an interview. There was a fresh-faced young man with an unintelligent face, who seemed to think himself equipped against the world beyond all misadventure by a collar of exceptional height, and another who introduced a note of gaiety by wearing a flannel shirt and a check suit of remarkable virulence. Every day Mr. Polly looked round to mark how many of the familiar faces had gone, and the deepening anxiety, reflecting his own, on the faces that remained, and every day some new type joined the drifting shoal. He realised how small a chance his poor letter from Easewood ran against this hungry cluster of competitors at the fountain-head. At the back of Mr. Polly's mind, while he made his observations, was a disagreeable flavour of a dentist's parlour. At any moment his name might be shouted, and he might have to haul himself into the presence of some fresh specimen of employer, and to repeat once more his passionate protestation of interest in the business, his possession of a capacity for zeal, zeal on behalf of any one who would pay him a yearly salary of twenty-six pounds a year. The prospective employer would unfold his ideals of the employee. I want a smart a willing young man, thoroughly willing, who won't object to take trouble. I don't want a slacker, the sort of fellow who has to be pushed up to his work and held there. I've got no use for him. At the back of Mr. Polly's mind, and quite beyond his control, the insubordinate phrase-maker would be proffering such combinations as chubby chops or chubby charmer as suitable for the gentleman, very much as a hat salesman proffers hats. "'I don't think you'll find much slackness about me, sir,' said Mr. Polly, brightly, trying to disregard his deeper self. "'I want a young man who means getting on.' "'Exactly, sir. Excelsior.' "'I beg your pardon?' Uh, "'I said uh, Excelsior, sir. It's a sort of motto of mine.' from Longfellow. Would you want me to serve through?" The chubby gentleman explained and reverted to his ideals with a faint air of suspicion. "'Do you mean getting on?' he asked. "'I hope so, sir,' said Mr. Polly. "'Get on or get out, eh?' Mr. Polly made a rapturous noise, nodded appreciation, and said indistinctly, uh, quite my style. "'Some of my people have been with me twenty years,' said the employer. "'My Manchester buyer came to me as a boy of twelve. You're a Christian?' 
Uh, Church of England, said Mr. Polly. Hmm, said the employer, a little checked. For good all-around business work I should have preferred a Baptist. Still... He studied Mr. Polly's tie, which was severely neat and businesslike, as became an aspiring outfitter. Mr. Polly's conception of his own prose and expression was rendered by that uncontrollable phrase-monger at the back as obsequies deference. "'I am inclined,' said the prospective employer in a conclusive manner, "'to look up your reference.' Mr. Polly stood up abruptly. "'Thank you,' said the employer, and dismissed him. Chump chops. How about chump chops? said the phrasemonger with an air of inspiration. I hope then to hear from you, sir, said Mr. Polly in his best salesman manner. If everything is satisfactory, said the prospective employer. Two. A man whose brain devotes its hinterland to making odd phrases and nicknames out of ill-conceived words, whose conception of life is a lump of auriferous rock to which all the value is given by rare veins of unbusinesslike joy, who reads Boccaccio and Rabelais and Shakespeare with gusto, and uses Stertonius Shover and Smart Junior as terms of bitterest opprobrium, is not likely to make a great success under modern business conditions. Mr. Polly dreamt always of picturesque and mellow things, and had an instinctive hatred of the strenuous life. He would have resisted the spell of ex-President Roosevelt, or General Baden-Powell, or Mr. Peter Keary, or the late Dr. Samuel Smiles, quite easily, and he loved Falstaff and Hudibras and coarse laughter, and the old England of Washington Irving, and the memory of Charles the Second's courtly days. His progress was necessarily slow. He did not get rises. He lost situations. There was something in his eye employers did not like. He would have lost his places oftener if he had not been at times an exceptionally brilliant salesman, rather carefully neat, and a slow but very fair window-dresser. He went from situation to situation. He invented a great wealth of nicknames. He conceived enmities and made friends, but none so richly satisfying as Parsons. He was frequently, but mildly and discursively, in love, and sometimes he thought of that girl who had given him a yellow-green apple. He had an idea, amounting to a flattering certainty, whose youthful freshness it was had stirred her to self-forgetfulness, and sometimes he thought of Foxbourne sleeping prosperously in the sun and he began to have moods of discomfort and lassitude and ill-temper due to the beginnings of indigestion. Various forces and suggestions came into his life and swayed him for longer and shorter periods. He went to Canterbury and came under the influence of Gothic architecture. There was a blood affinity between Mr. Polly and the Gothic, in the Middle Ages he would no doubt have sat upon a scaffolding, and carved out penetrating and none too flattering portraits of church dignities upon the capitals. And when he strolled with his hands behind his back, along the cloisters behind the cathedral, and looked at the rich grass plot in the centre, he had the strangest sense of being at home, far more than he had ever been at home before. Portly capons, he used to murmur to himself, under the impression that he was naming a characteristic type of medieval churchman. He liked to sit in the nave during the service, and look through the great gates at the candles and choristers, and listen to the organ-sustained voices. 
but the transepts he never penetrated because of the charge for admission. The music and the long vista of the fretted roof filled him with a vague and mystical happiness that he had no words, even mispronounceable words, to express. But some of the smug monuments in the aisles got a wreath of epithets. Metrorious urnfuls, funereal claims, dejected angelosity, for example. He wandered about the precincts and speculated about the people who lived in the ripe and cosy houses of grey stone that cluster there so comfortably. Through green doors in high stone walls he caught glimpses of level lawns and blazing flower-beds. Mullioned windows revealed shaded reading lamps and disciplined shelves of brown bound books. Now and then a dignitary in gaiters would pass him, portly capon, or a drift of white-robed choir-boys cross a distant arcade and vanish into a doorway, or the pink and cream of some girlish dress flit like a butterfly across the cool still spaces of the place. Particularly he responded to the ruined arches of the Benedictine's infirmary and the view of Bell Harry Tower from the school buildings. He was stirred to read the Canterbury Tales, but could not get on with Chaucer's old-fashioned English. It fatigued his attention, and he would have given all the story-telling very readily for a few adventures on the road. He wanted these nice people to live more and yarn less. He liked the wife of Bath very much. He would have liked to have known that woman. At Canterbury, too, he first to his knowledge saw Americans. His shop did a good class trade in Westgate Street, and he would see them go on the way to stare at Chaucer's checkers, and then turn down Mercy Lane to Prior Goldstone's gate. It impressed him that they were always in a kind of quiet hurry, and very determined and methodical people much more so than any English he knew. Cultured rapacity, he tried. Verocious return to the heritage. He would expound them, incidentally, to his attendant apprentices. He had overheard a little lady putting her view to a friend near the Christchurch gate. The accent and intonation had hung in his memory, and he would reproduce them more or less accurately. Now, does this Marlowe monument really and truly matter? He had heard the little lady inquire. We've no time for side-shows and second-rate stunts, maybe. We just want the big, simple things of the place. Just the broad, elemental Canterbury proposition. What is it saying to us? I want to get right hold of that, and then have tea in the very room that Chaucer did, and hustle to get that 814 train back to London." He would go over these precious phrases, finding them full of an indescribable flavour. "'Just the broad, elemental Canterbury proposition,' he would repeat. He would try to imagine Parsons confronted with Americans. For his own part, he knew himself to be altogether inadequate. Canterbury was the most congenial situation Mr. Polly ever found during those wander years, albeit a very desert so far as companionship went. 3. It was after Canterbury that the universe became really disagreeable to Mr. Polly. It was brought home to him, not so much vividly as with a harsh and ungainly insistence, that he was a failure in his trade. It was not the trade he ought to have chosen, though what trade he ought to have chosen was by no means clear. He made great but irregular efforts, and produced a forced smartness that, like a cheap dye, refused to stand sunshine. He acquired a sort of parsimony also, 
in which acquisition he was helped by one or two phrases of absolute impecuniosity. But he was hopeless in competition against the naturally gifted, the born hustlers, the young men who meant to get on. He left the Canterbury place very regretfully. He and another commercial gentleman took a boat one Sunday afternoon at Starry on the Sour, when the wind was in the west, and sailed it very happily eastward for an hour. They had never sailed a boat before, and it seemed simple and wonderful. When they turned they found the river too narrow for tacking, and the tide running out like a sluice. They battled back to Sturry in the course of six hours, at a shilling for the first hour and sixpence for each hour thereafter, rowing a mile in an hour and a half or so, until the turn of the tide came to help them. And then they had a night walk to Canterbury, and found themselves remorselessly locked out. The Canterbury employer was an amiable, religious-spirited man, and he would probably not have dismissed Mr. Polly if that unfortunate tendency to phrase things had not shocked him. "'A tide's a tide, sir,' said Mr. Polly, feeling that things were not so bad. "'I've no lunatic power to alter that.' It proved impossible to explain to the Canterbury employer that this was not a highly disrespectful and blasphemous remark. "'And besides, what good are you to me this morning, do you think?' said the Canterbury employer, with your arms pulled out of your sockets. So Mr. Polly resumed his observations in the Wood Street warehouses once more, and had some dismal times. The shoal of fish waiting for the crumbs of employment seemed larger than ever. He took counsel with himself. Should he chuck the outfitting? It wasn't any good for him now. And presently, when he was older and his youthful smartness had passed into the dullness of middle age, it would be worse. What else could he do? He could think of nothing. He went one night to a music hall and developed a vague idea of a comic performance. The comic men seemed violent rowdies, and not at all funny. But when he thought of the great pit of the audience yawning before him, he realised that his was an altogether too delicate talent for such a use. He was impressed by the charm of selling vegetables by auction in one of those open shops near London Bridge, but admitted upon reflection his general want of technical knowledge. He made some inquiries about emigration, but none of the colonies were in want of shop assistance without capital. He kept up his attendance in Wood Street. He subdued his ideal of salary by the sum of five pounds a year, and was taken at that into a driving establishment in Clapham, which dealt chiefly in ready-made suits, fed its assistants in an underground dining-room, and kept them till twelve on Saturdays. He found it hard to be cheerful there. His fits of indigestion became worse, and he began to lie awake at night and think. Sunshine and laughter seemed things lost for ever. Picnics and shouting in the moonlight. The chief shopwalker took a dislike to him and nagged him. "'Now there, Polly! Look alive, Polly!' became the burthen of his days. "'As smart a chap as you could have,' said the chief shopwalker. "'But no zest! No zest! No vim! What's the matter with you?' During his night vigils Mr. Polly had a feeling. A young rabbit must have very much the feeling when, after a youth of gambling in sunny woods and furtive jolly raids upon the growing wheat, and exciting triumphant bolts before ineffectual casual dogs, it finds itself at last, for a long night of floundering effort and perplexity, in a net for the rest of its life. 
he could not grasp what was wrong with him. He made enormous efforts to diagnose his case. Was he really just a lazy slacker who ought to buck up? He couldn't find it in him to believe it. He blamed his father a good deal. It's what fathers are for. In putting him to a trade he wasn't happy to follow. But he found it impossible to say what he ought to have followed. He felt there had been something stupid about his school, but just where that came in he couldn't say. He made some perfectly sincere efforts to buck up and shove ruthlessly, but that was infernal, impossible. He had to admit himself miserable, with all the misery of a social misfit, and with no clear prospect of more than the most incidental happiness ahead of him and for all his attempts at self-reproach or self-discipline, he felt at bottom that he wasn't at fault. As a matter of fact, all the elements of his troubles had been adequately diagnosed by a certain high-browed, spectacled gentleman living at Highbury, wearing a gold pince-nez, and writing for the most part in the beautiful library of the Reform Club. This gentleman did not know Mr. Polly personally, but he had dealt with him generally as one of those ill-adjusted units that abound in a society that has failed to develop a collective intelligence and a collective will for order commensurate with its complexities. But phrases of that sort had no appeal for Mr. Polly. End of chapter 3《Chapter Four, Section One of the History of Mr. Polly. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Adrian Pretzelis. Chapter Four, Section One. Mr. Polly, an orphan. One. Then a great change was brought about in the life of Mr. Polly by the death of his father. His father had died suddenly. The local practitioner still clung to his theory that it was imagination he suffered from, but compromised in the certificate with the appendicitis that was then so fashionable, and Mr. Polly found himself heir to a debatable number of pieces of furniture in the house of his cousin near Eastwood Junction, a family Bible, an engraved portrait of Gary Baldy and a bust of Mr. Gladstone, an invalid gold watch, a gold locket formerly belonging to his mother, some minor jewellery and bric-a-brac, a quantity of nearly valueless old clothes, and an insurance policy and money in the bank amounting altogether to the sum of three hundred and ninety-five pounds. Mr. Polly had always regarded his father as an immortal, as an eternal fact and his father, being of a reserved nature in his declining years, had said nothing about the insurance policy. Both wealth and bereavement, therefore, took Mr. Polly by surprise, and found him a little inadequate. His mother's death had been a childish grief, and long forgotten, and the strongest affection in his life had been for Parsons. An only child of sociable tendencies necessarily turns his back a good deal upon home, and the aunt who had succeeded his mother was an economist and furniture polisher, a knuckle-wrapper and sharp silencer, no friend for a slovenly little boy. He had loved other little boys and girls transitorily, None had been frequent and familiar enough to strike deep roots in his heart, and he had grown up with a tattered and dissipated affectionless that was becoming wildly shy. His father had always been a stranger, an irritable stranger, with exceptional powers of intervention and comment, and an air of being disappointed about his offspring. It was shocking to lose him, it was like an unexpected hole in the universe, and the writing of death upon the sky. 
but it did not tear Mr. Polly's heartstrings at first so much as rouse him to a pitch of vivid attention. He came down to the cottage at Easewood in response to an urgent telegram and found his father already dead. His cousin Johnson received him with much solemnity and ushered him upstairs to look at a stiff, straight, shrouded form with a face unwontedly quiet and, as it seemed with its pinched nostrils, scornful. "'Looks uh, peaceful,' said Mr. Polly, disregarding the scorn to the best of his ability. "'It was a merciful relief,' said Mr. Johnson. There was a pause. Second, uh, second departed I've ever seen, not counting mummies,' said Mr. Polly, feeling it necessary to say something. "'We did uh, all we could.' Uh, no doubt of it, old man, said Mr. Polly. A second long pause followed, and then, much to Mr. Polly's great relief, Johnson moved towards the door. Afterwards, Mr. Polly went for a solitary walk in the evening light, and as he walked, suddenly his dead father became real to him. He thought of things far away down the perspective of memory, of jolly moments when his father had skylarked with a wildly excited little boy, of a certain annual visit to the Crystal Palace pantomime, full of trivial, glittering incidents and wonders, of his father's dread back while customers were in the old, minutely known shop. It is curious that the memory which seemed to link him nearest to the dead man was the memory of a fit of passion. His father had wanted to get a small sofa up the narrow winding staircase from the little room behind the shop to the bedroom above, and it had jammed. For a time his father had coaxed, and then groaned like a soul in torment, and given way to blind fury, had sworn, kicked and struck at the offending piece of furniture, and finally wrenched it upstairs with considerable incidental damage to lath and plaster, and one of the casters. That moment, when self-control was altogether torn aside, the shocked discovery of his father's perfect humanity had left a singular impression on Mr. Polly's queer mind. It was as if something extravagantly vital had come out of his father, and laid a warmly passionate hand upon his heart. He remembered that now very vividly, and it became a clue to endless other memories that had else been dispersed and confusing. A weakly, willful being struggling to get obdurate things round impossible corners. In that symbol Mr. Polly could recognise himself and all the trouble of humanity. He hadn't had a particularly good time, poor old chap and now it was all over, finished. Johnson was the sort of man who derives great satisfaction from a funeral, a melancholy, serious, practical-minded man of five-and-thirty, with great powers of advice. He was the upline ticket clerk at Easewood Junction, and felt the responsibilities of his position. He was naturally thoughtful and reserved, and greatly sustained in that by an innate rectitude of body, and an overhanging and forward inclination of the upper part of his face and head. He was pale but freckled, and his dark grey eyes were deeply set. His lightest interest was cricket, but he did not take that lightly. His chief holiday was to go to a cricket match, which he did as if he was going to church, and he watched critically, applauded sparingly, and was darkly offended by any unorthodox play. His convictions upon all subjects were taciturnly inflexible. He was an obstinate player of draughts and chess, and an earnest and persistent reader of The British Weekly. His wife was a pink, short, willfully smiling, managing, ingratiating, talkative woman, 
who was determined to be pleasant, and take a bright, hopeful view of everything, even when it was not really bright and hopeful. She had large blue expressive eyes and a round face, and she always spoke of her husband as Harold. She addressed sympathetic and considerate remarks about the deceased Mr. Polly in notes of brisk encouragement. "'He was really quite cheerful at the end,' she said several times with congratulatory gusto. "'Quite cheerful.' She made dying seem almost agreeable. Both these people were resolved to treat Mr. Polly very well, and to help his exceptional incompetence in every possible way, and after a simple supper of ham and bread and cheese and pickles, and cold apple tart and small beer had been cleared away, they put him into the armchair almost as though he was an invalid, and sat on chairs that made them look down on him, and opened a directive discussion for the arrangements for the funeral. After all, a funeral is a distinct social opportunity, and rare when you have no family and few relations, and they did not want to see it spoilt and wasted. "'You'll have a hearse, of course,' said Mrs. Johnson. "'Not one of them combinations with the driver sitting on the coffin. Disrespectful, I think they are. I can't fancy how people can bring themselves to be buried in combinations.' She flattened her voice in a manner she used to imitate aesthetic feeling. "'I do like them glass hearses,' she said. "'So refined and nice they are.' "'Podger's hearse you'll have,' said Johnson conclusively. "'It's the best in Easewood.' "'Everything that's right and proper,' said Mr. Polly. "'Podger's ready to come and measure at any time,' said Johnson. Then you'll want a mourner's carriage or two, according as to whom you're going to invite," said Mr. Johnson. "'I uh, didn't think of inviting anyone," said Polly. "'Oh, you'll have to ask a few friends,' said Mr. Johnson. "'You can't let your father go to his grave without asking a few friends.' "'A uh, funereal baked meats, like.' said Mr. Polly. "'Not baked, but of course you'll have to give them something. Ham and chicken's very suitable. You don't want a lot of cooking with the ceremony coming into the middle of it. I wonder who Alfred ought to invite, Harold. Just the immediate relations. One doesn't want a great crowd of people, and one doesn't want not to show respect.' "'But he hated our relations, most of them.' "'He's not hating them now,' said Mrs. Johnson. "'You may be sure of that. "'It's just because of that I think they ought to come, all of them, even your Auntie Mildred.' "'A bit vultural, isn't it?' said Mr. Polly, unheeded. Oh, "'Wouldn't be more than twelve or thirteen people if they all came,' said Mr. Johnson. We could have everything put out ready in the back room, and the gloves and the whisky in the front room. And while we were all at the ceremony, Bessie could bring it all into the front room on a tray, and put it out nice and proper. There'd have to be whisky, and cherry or port for the ladies." "'Where will you get your morning? asked Johnson abruptly. Mr. Polly had not yet considered this by-product of sorrow. Haven't thought of it yet, old man." A disagreeable feeling spread over his body, as though he was blackening as he sat. He hated black garments. "'I suppose I must have mourning,' he said. "'Well,' said Johnson, with a solemn smile. "'Got to see it through,' said Mr. Polly, indistinctly. "'If I were you—' said Johnson. I should get ready-made trousers. That's all you really want, and a black satin tie and a top hat with a deep mourning band, and gloves." "'Jet cufflinks he ought to have, as chief mourner,' said Mrs. Johnson. "'Not obligatory,' said Johnson. "'It shows respect,' said Mrs. Johnson. "'It shows respect, of course.' said Johnson. 
and then mrs johnson went on with the utmost gusto to the details of the casket while mr polly sat more and more deeply drooping into the armchair assenting with a note of protest to all they said after he had retired for the night he remained for a long time perched on the edge of the sofa which was his bed staring at the prospect before him chasing the old man about up to the last he said he hated the thought and elaboration of death as a healthy animal must hate it his mind struggled with unwanted social problems got to put them away somehow i suppose said mr polly wish i'd looked him up a bit more while he was alive said mr polly two bereavement came to mr polly before the realization of opulence and its anxieties and responsibilities that only dawned upon him on the morrow which chanced to be sunday as he walked with johnson before church time about the tangle of struggling building enterprises that constituted the rising urban district of easewood johnson was off duty that morning and devoted the time very generously to the admonitory discussion of Mr. Polly's worldly outlook. "'Don't seem to get the hang of the business somehow,' said Mr. Polly. "'Too much blooming humbug in it for my way of thinking.' "'If I were you,' said Mr. Johnson, "'I should push for a first-class place in London. Take almost nothing and live on my reserves. That's what I should do.' "'Come the heavy,' said Mr. Polly get a better class reference there was a pause think of uh, investing your money asked johnson hardly got used to the idea of having it yet old man you'll have to do something with it give you nearly twenty pounds a year if you invest it properly haven't seen it yet in that light said mr polly defensively there's no end of things you could put it into it's getting it out again i shouldn't feel sure of i'm no sort of financier sooner back horses i wouldn't do that if i was you not my style old man it's a nest egg said johnson mr polly made an indeterminate noise there's uh, building societies johnson threw out in a speculative tone mr polly with detached brevity admitted that there were you might lend it on mortgage said johnson very safe form of investment shan't think anything about it not till the old man's underground said mr polly with an inspiration they turned a corner that led towards the junction might do worse said johnson then put it into a small shop at the moment this remark made very little appeal to mr polly but afterwards it developed it fell into his mind like some small obscure seed and germinated these shops aren't in a bad position said johnson the row he referred to gaped in the late painful stage in building before the healing touch of the plasterer assuages the roughness of the brickwork the space for the shop yawned an oblong gap below framed above by an iron girder windows and fittings to suit tenant a board at the end of the row promised and behind was the door space and a glimpse of stairs going up to the living-rooms above not a bad position said johnson and led the way into the establishment room for fixtures there he said pointing to the blank wall the two men went upstairs to the little sitting-room or best bedroom it would have to be above the shop then they descended to the kitchen below rooms in a new house always look a bit small said johnson they came out of the house again by the prospective back door and picked their way through the builder's litter across the yard space to the road again 
they drew nearer the junction to where a pavement and shops, already opened and active, formed the commercial centre of Easewood. On the opposite side of the way, the side door of a flourishing little establishment opened, and a man and his wife and a little boy in a sailor suit came into the street. The wife was a pretty woman in brown, with a floriferous straw hat, and the group was altogether very Sundayfied, and shiny, and spick and span. The shop itself had a large plate-glass window, whose contents were now veiled by a buff blind on which was inscribed in scrolly letters, Rhymer, Pork Butcher and Provision Merchant, and then, with voluptuous elaboration, The World-Famed Easewood Sausage. Greetings were exchanged between Mr. Johnson and this distinguished comestible. "'Off to church already?' said Johnson. "'Walking across the fields to Little Dorrington,' said Mr. Rymer. "'Very pleasant walk,' said Johnson. "'Very,' said Mr. Rymer. "'Hope you'll enjoy it,' said Mr. Johnson. "'That chap's done well.' said Johnson, sotto voce, as they went on. Came here with nothing, practically, four years ago, and thin as a lath. Look at him now. He's worked hard, of course, said Johnson, improving the occasion. Thought fell between the cousins for a space. Some men can do one thing, said Johnson, and some another. For a man who sticks to it, there's a lot to be done in a shop. End of chapter 4, section 1